A child in care is legally parented by the government. Therefore, I would judge the government above all things on how it is as a parent. Okay? That means what services are they giving that child in education? What services are they giving that child in health? What services are they giving that child in, um, uh, in housing? Because if the child has been given those services for the first 18 years, and if they're done well, I, I can guarantee that they're being done well for everybody else. Because the child in care is most in need. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is the poet Lem Sisse. Now Lem has had a remarkable life, anchored in his poetry, as he says, but he has done many things along the way. He has revealed a great deal about himself and his childhood and being a child in care who was long-term fostered, a man who has been an activist, a playwright, a journalist, uh, a speaker, uh, and he's achieved an awful lot. He's also a broadcaster and he makes lots of, lots of programmes as well. So, Lem, thank you for coming in. And thank welcome. you. This book that you have just released, Let the Light Pour In, yes. are the poems that you tweet and have done for a long time. Yes. Um, and they are... Well, what are, are they quatrains? They're quatrains. Are they a stanza? What are they? They're quatrains. They're, They're four-line poems uh, that rhyme on the second and the fourth line. I write them first thing in the morning, and then I put them out on socials. Instagram, not so much. Twitter, it's called X now. Uh, Facebook, etc. And they are, are my immediate um, consolidation of what I'm feeling, where I am, and what is about to happen. Possibly. So you write them on the day? I write them on the day. You don't stack I, them up and then say, that one's for Monday, that one's for Tuesday? No, I don't, because I haven't got the time. <laughs> but it's a great way of starting the day, is to have a creative injection, a connection with the world, uh, which is through my primary concern, which is poetry. Um, by the way, Krishnan, I need to admit this. Some of them are terrible. <laughs> okay? That's, that's the way it is. Not the ones in the book, but when I put them out in the morning... I have an hour to write it or two hours and that's it. And I like that. I like the, I like the risk of writing uh, in the moment and sending it, out, sending it out in the moment. I like it. Now, it's called Let the Light Pour In and they are amazingly cheerful. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> for, for a man who has written about depression. Yeah, I've written about depression and also about what, what happened to me in my family and why the story that I've been given to live with is a burden. I've had to write about it as a witness and as a detective, okay, and as the crime scene. I've had no choice about that, but my essence is one of... Uh, a, a, I have a positive uh, essence, and I think depression quite often is the, the corruption, the, the attempt to corrupt the, the essence of what it is to be a human being um, and the fight against that. For anyone who hasn't followed the story, I mean, your mother, well, your father was a pilot. Yes, for Ethiopian Airlines. And your mother, in the, in the 1960s, yeah. it was not the done thing to be... An unmarried mother? No, not in, in this country. I in mean, this country? In Ethiopia, she would have been okay. Right. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, but well, it wasn't country, celebrated in Ethiopia, but she would have been okay. She would have had people to have looked after her, et cetera, et cetera. But in this country, you were sent off to a home for unmarried she mothers was sent and the off babies to her, were taken yeah, exactly. away. Yeah. She was sent to a mother and baby home. She came through a Seventh-day Adventist uh, college in Ethiopia and then came to study uh, th at, in Bracknell in Berkshire with a college which is actually still there. And then she was sent to the north of England from Bracknell into the mother and baby home system, which was a system around England um, where unmarried mothers were sent to have their babies. The nuns would look after the homes and the social workers would get those women to sign the adoption papers. This was the crucial thing. And then the child would be legally adopted by another family. The mother, who's often a young woman on the edge of childhood and adulthood, she'd be 
sort of sliced away from the child, often told that she might be able to visit them, but never able to visit them. And the child would go, and that's, that's the story of uh, adoption in the late 1960s. My mother would not sign the adoption papers. This is really key. So the social worker gave me to foster parents and said to the foster parents, you can have him forever, we'll get her to sign the adoption papers. The only reason I know that is because they told me that. That, that was my origin story. Your mother didn't want you, and she was so peevish, she wouldn't sign the adoption papers. But you're ours forever. Don't worry, we chose you. You're the chosen one, etc., etc. So I believe that. And then at 12 years of age, and they were my mum and dad. And at 12 years of age, they put me into children's homes and said they would never visit me and never did visit me. So that's, that's my story. And then at... 18 years of age, when I left the children's homes, because I was in four different children's homes, I was given my birth certificate, and that had my real name on it, Lem Sisse, and I was given a letter from my mother pleading for me back. Within three years, I'd found her, I had my first book published, I'd moved to Manchester, into the middle of that maelstrom that was mid-1980s Manchester with Tony Wilson. So you say you're Ethiopian? Yes. How, how Ethiopian can you be when you're from Wigan? It's funny, isn't it? Because I was stolen by Wigan authority from my Ethiopian mother and then it took me most of my adult life to find my way back to Ethiopia. Yeah, a few years ago I was meeting the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, Abiy Ahmed, um, who's a Nobel Prize winner. And I'm known to Ethiopians because my name, Lemen, as it's said in Ethiopia, means the question why. And nobody's called why in Ethiopia. It's not a name that people have. But I'm the boy whose name is Why, who searched for his family and found his, his ancestral home. Actually, I found a kind of home in Ethiopia. It's like I have been adopted by a country. And do you feel adopted by Ethiopia? Wherever I am in the world, uh, in an airport or a hotel or whatever, there will be an Ethiopian who sees me and goes, oh, Lemon! And it f fills my heart with pride and makes me sense, just have a touch of the belonging which was stolen, or stolen from me. And have you understood, because you talked about your mother not wanting you to be taken away from her. Yeah. I mean, she, she, I have the letter, it's in my book, it, where she's pleading for me back to the social worker who'd named me from after himself and squirreled me away to uh, foster parents in Wigan. So have you understood how that happened now, now that you've seen all the documents? Fully understood the complexity of it, yeah. And most of all, the trauma that my mother must have gone through and gone through for the years that followed because then there was a revolution in Ethiopia and she had to flee the country like a lot of other people, etc, etc. How did you discover your own writing? Um, well, I just knew. I, I, you know, I just knew. I knew from the age of 12. There is a Radio 4 documentary where I went back to the children's home and there's a staff member in the children's home who, who she said, in fact, it's not a staff member, it's a cleaner. And she's, oh, I, oh I, you'll know this accent. Oh, I remember you. Oh, you used to write your poems in Corner. I knew I w was going to be a poet and I knew I wanted to be a poet. And I said the same at school. I, you know, I, it, was very, it was very clear to me. But just hearing that story just makes me think, are you glad that you were in the north of England because of the people who you were also surrounded by? Um, in that there's an openness, I think. I, in the I, north? Well, as <laughs> I, my name, the social worker who stole me from my mother, and I've proved all of this, named me Norman illegally. Okay, so he gave me to foster parents and he said, his name is Norman. You can have him forever, but you must call him Norman. A couple of years ago, only a couple of years ago, um, I, re I found out that the name Norman means man of the north. That's what it means. Oh my gosh. By the way, the name on my birth certificate was always Lem Sisse. So my name has always been Lem Sisse. I just did not know it. If I could have had my experience in any other way, I would have just... I, I would have had a family. 
my my experience in the north is one of a person who was stolen from his mother and then imprisoned in a series of children's homes until I was 18 and then thrown out and with all record of what happened to me locked away that is my experience of the north i love the north because it's where i'm from the north of england but i'm also from ethiopia which is where my mother's from and i love ethiopia as well um I am all of those things, a northerner who lives in London and Manchester, I'm from Ethiopia. I, you know, I, I wouldn't even, I don't even know. No, I am a lefty. Um, no, gosh. Why do you struggle one. with that? <sighs> because, I, you know, I grew up in 1980s Manchester. I went to Manchester from the villages of Lancashire. It seems to me as I've grown as a poet and a, a writer that that the left has changed. In fact, politics has changed in such a big way. And, and where artists are within that is not as obvious as it was in the days of Red Wedge, it seems to me. So we are activists, but I'm not necessarily an activist for any one yeah, political movement. Political party? Political party. I but you are of the left. Yes, I, that's where I'm from. I mean, I, I, you know, I grew up... Look, people don't realise this in the south of England. And I know I'm going to go back to the mid-1980s. And I know I'm going to mention Margaret Thatcher. But she pummeled the north of England. She... I mean, it was a, a war, an actual war against men and women who were in... Uh, who, who lived next door to me. But but instinctively, you 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 then come from a place where it was kind of normal to to hate Thatcher, to hate Thatcher, yeah, and therefore what and, she and, stood and what for, it stood for, yeah, and, and and therefore the the Conservative Party. Saying that though, I've seen some incredible work done by the Conservative Party uh, for uh, children in care. You know, there is more happened under the Conservatives' watch for young people in care than ever in my lifetime. I, yeah, I've seen what has happened over the past 15 years, and it's been, some of it's been good. It's, 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 it's really strange. There is a lot that's happened for young people in care in one way, and yet children's services are losing money in, in another way, and I, I don't really understand that. Actually, I do understand it to a degree. If they put you in charge... What would you do? I would judge how well a government is doing based on how well they treat a child in care. A child in care is legally parented by the government. Therefore, I would judge the government above all things on how it is as a parent. Okay? That means what services are they giving that child in education? What services are they giving that child in health? What services are they giving that child in, um, uh, in housing? Because if the child has been given those services for the first 18 years, and if they're done well, I, I can guarantee that they're being done well for everybody else. Because the child in care is most in need. And did you come out of care thinking there was something wrong with you or that there was something wrong with the system? Oh, there was definitely something wrong with me. When I was brought up in care, um, the, the pervading uh, feeling was that it was actually something wrong with you. You were the bad kid. People in the housing uh, around, the, around the estate where the children's home was would, would say that's where the naughty kids go. Parents would say to their children, if you're naughty, I'll put you into a children's home. You know, the entire idea that you were a good person was anathema to children in care. We were taught that there was something wrong with us. It's the absolute opposite. We uh, were the traumatised ones in, in, in care. And, and we're even more traumatised by the general opinion that we're, we're bad news. I believe that children in care have actually got a unique insight into the human condition, and they get it much earlier than most of us. Most of us have to wait for our parents to die to realise how much they mean to us. When they, you know, most parents, most grandparents have to realise the importance of touch 
when their children go away from them. And when their children come back, they touch them. The grandparent touches the child and their face and their hands because they realize that people are stuck. They're losing touch, literally losing touch. Children in care, that happens to them in, in, in care. So they get an insight into the human condition, which I think is incredibly powerful and rich. And they are not accepted for it. They are not seen for it. They are punished. They are thought of as bad. Um, and yet, you know, we watch the X-Men and we watch Superman was uh, adopted, you know. And what did Superman, what was he most frightened of? Kryptonite, the reminder of home. Harry Potter, what was, he, what was worse for him? The scar on his forehead, the reminder of his dead parents. You know, children in care are in touch with, with a, a set of emotions which are normally employed much later in life when you've grown and you're, you're more likely to be able to accept that people disappear. When did you see that? When did you work out that it wasn't you? Uh, I think I knew immediately. In fact, I know I knew immediately because I documented it. I wrote the poems about it. I want to remember a poem that's in here. Oh, I, I, I can remember it. I can remember it. I am the bull in the china shop and with all my strength and will. Is it there? Gosh, you've got Amazingly, it Amazingly, I had it open. It, open. I, I, it was literally you, in front of me. You read that to me, please. I am the bull in a china shop, and with all my strength and will, as a storm smashed the teacups, I stood still. That's, that's exactly, that is exactly what I was talking about to you just now. I am the bull in ch the china shop, and with all my strength and will, as a storm smashed the teacups, I stood still. That's, that's it. Poetry is a witness. What's your family now? I don't know. <laughs> like, I, but I don't, I don't feel bad. I don't, I don't feel, um, I don't feel like I have any less. You know, I don't have, you know, any less. Uh, I used to feel that I c c couldn't get married, for example, because... I'd have nobody to come to the wedding from a family. Like my side, I always thought of my side of the church. This is so depressing and it's not <laughs> meant to be depressing. Not, not because I'm trying to be positive. All of us have different relationships with our families and um, we all do as best as, we, this is the most important thing, to do as best as you can with what you've got. Okay, I might not be able to articulate what my family is. I really can't. But that's okay. You know, I, I'm okay. Are you, are you writing consciously to let the light pour in as well? I mean, to, to say, cheer, to almost cheer yourself up in the morning, to look at the, the light rather than the dark. That's it. So 100%, that's it. Um, although I don't uh, set out to say something positive necessarily okay you know when you write you you are you, you are discovering and searching at the same time but you can't i don't i'm not say, i'm not writing to say now i'm going to write something positive for the world to hear and people will smile when they read it you know i can't i can't do that you can't as a writer do that either um but i do commission myself to explore. Can, can we go through some of them? And give, give, you we know, can, yes. Would we you can. read some? And yes. Then maybe talk me through a couple. How do you do it, said night? How do you wake and shine? I keep it simple, said light. One day at a time. I had a woman write to me from Manchester University, a lecturer, and she asked if she could have this poem and, and, and type it out, and could I sign it? That was it. A friend of hers asked her, could I sign it? And I, I did, and I sent it to her, and she put it on her fridge, and she was suffering from a terminal illness, but this poem, every day she would read it, and it would help her. And the next time I heard from... Uh, that uh, family was her son who asked me, could he read it at a funeral? Gosh. 
you know, four lines that were found in, uh, in that morning exploration of the imagination, which could go to the heart of somebody at the most important time in their life. And that's what poetry is. It's a bridge between the spiritual and the physical. Um, Shall I choose another one? Carry on. I, I, um, I want the sun to be you and the sky to be me by the coast and gulls and rhyming sea. That was when I was away from uh, my girlfriend at the time. And um, uh, yeah, I was thinking about her. These are like little memory posts for me as well. They tell me where I was. I can't remember exactly where I was, but I was by the sea. And I was on my own and I was performing somewhere in England, which is what I do quite a lot with my poetry. And uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So these are my, um, no, I can't see. I've got, not got my glasses Do you need on. your glasses? Why don't you want to wear your glasses? I haven't worn glasses my entire life. And I would prefer to continue to not wearing glasses. If I wore glasses in my teens, my early teens and, and childhood, and I grew up with them, I wouldn't mind as much, but I feel like my face is being invaded. Um, but I'm also probably, the truth of this is that I'm getting older. And I, I think there's quite possibly... You're struggling with that. I'm struggling with the act of, yeah, the thought of getting older. Um, it's interesting being on stage, uh, reading poems as you get older, because you start to notice that the audience is getting older with you as well. Um, I mean, do you, do you feel middle-aged? Oh, I, I, I mean, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. And so um, I was just saying, actually, to the woman in makeup, I was saying that, um, that just as you're getting it together, you start to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> And then you die. That's what I yeah. said. I said, I better write that down, you know, just as you're getting it together, you start to fall apart. <laughs> and, um, and that's, it's funny, isn't it? That's okay. I'm, I'm, um, I feel more, yeah, I feel the things that have driven me and uh, haunted me, actually, uh, they're, 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 they're no longer haunting me. I mean, do you feel that you have, you know, that this has been a process of sort of, you know, self-therapy, if you like, talking about it, writing about it, exploring it in public? I'm respectful enough of therapy to know that therapy is therapy, okay? Um, writing is not therapy. Otherwise, I would have a book on the other side of the table and I'd be able to speak to it and it would be able to give me advice. It doesn't. So I don't think of uh, writing as a therapeutic exploration, nor do I think finding my family, my mother and my father and traveling the world to meet them has been therapeutic, nor has taken the government to court for stealing me as a child from my mother. I'm going down a rabbit hole now. Should I? No, carry on, carry on. I took the government to court for stealing my mother, my family, for changing my name, for imprisoning me as a child and for giving me to foster parents uh, in denial of my mother. And, um, and um, to do that, I had to have a psychologist report written about me. Uh, the psychologist report details every relationship, every insecurity, every drug I've taken, every alcoholic binge, um, just goes through all of my life to find where my, uh, what my psychological m makeup is, to present to the court that this is what you've done to this person. So I decided that I would hear my report for the first time in front of a live audience at the Royal Court. Within seven days, we sold all the tickets uh, and it was called the report at the Royal Court. My barrister came. He'd never seen anything like it in his life. My, my solicitor came and I heard my report, a psychological breakdown of my entire life, 
that diagnosed me with PTSD and all kinds of other stuff. But, and I heard it for the first time live on stage at the Royal Court uh, in front of a, 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 a packed house. That was extreme verbatim theatre. It's never been done before. It's never been done since. What do you think the effect of that on you was? What it did for me is, for 18 years I was in care, okay, Krishnan? We've all got our stories. But my life for 18 years was public record. There was 18 years worth of files they were locked in the Iron Mountain, a company called the Iron Mountain, could you believe it? I left care at 1980, in 1984, George Orwell's 1984. I wasn't allowed to make, see my files. I made a Radio 4 documentary in 1995 called Child of the State in search of those files from Wigan. Didn't get them. It took Donna Hall, the head of the authority, to see, hold on a minute, this person has done everything to get their files. Let's find them. And she did. So in, uh, in, when I was 48 years of age, I could show these files for what they were, which was the closest I had to family. Family is just a group of people proving that each other exists over a lifetime. Birthdays, anniversaries, Christmases. In lieu of family, I had to make the public my witness you know, or, or witness to what I was finding. And then they could make their judgment. They could make their minds up. I had to do it in a court of law. I had to do it in theatre. I had to do it in, um, on, in books, etc. And so, I mean, you, 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 you've been an activist. Yeah. Um, you know, do you still think of yourself as that way? Do you still think of somebody who is changing the world, wants to change the world? Um, my ambition is that I write a book that can change a nation on, on one issue. And do you feel comfortable going to other issues that you care about? Or do you feel now a responsibility that care is your issue? I've recently stopped um, doing um, interviews about the care system um, because I've seen that there are other people now. But I'm seeing development happening and uh, I can definitely sort of take a step back uh, and find where I could be most effective. So, so in that case, what, what else gets you out of bed? What else makes well, you angry? What, what else? gets me out of bed is, is, um, is, is, is writing, this, uh, writing the poem first thing. Um, I'm not looking for what makes me angry. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not motivated by anger and I can't be. I remember this from the care system leaving care. In fact, in here, there is a poem. A burning procession in the sky above. Anger is an expression in search of love. Um, I remember realising from when I left the children's homes that I could not depend on anger to motivate me to action because that would mean I was always looking for a fire to put out. I think of Superman who could only prove he was Superman when something was going wrong. So if, if, if the world wasn't threatened, Superman would have to cause a threat so that he could turn up and save the world and become who he was, who he truly was. Um, I, I don't want to be that. I'm not Superman. I'm Lem Sisei from Wigan, who's Ethiopian and British and Northern, and lives in London. I'm comfortable with all of the above. <laughs> yeah. If you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? Um, I would uh, help people make the connection between popular and classic culture and young people in care. Elaborate. Superman was a foster child. Harry Potter was a foster child. Jane Eyre was adopted. Luke Skywalker was fostered. Frodo Baggins was a foster child. Half of the X-Men uh, children were fostered uh, and adopted. Uh, Romulus and Remus were searching for their parent. Jesus um, uh, had two fathers. Uh, Mohammed, peace be upon him, uh, was fostered by his grandmother. The fostered, adopted, and um, 
orphaned child is central to popular culture and classic culture. Once we realise that there are unique attributes which have which have brought them into those conditions of being being who they are, um, we can see those in young people in care and serve them uh, appropriately. Why do you think all of those characters have been created by people who hadn't had that experience? Why that's, are they lying on That's worth questioning. That's, that's the question that, that we need to ask ourselves. What is it about a child who has no parents or so, who's been brought up in care, fostered, adopted, orphaned, what is it about them which makes them perfect characters for writers to use uh, in, in adventures? I'll tell you what it is. It's that outside of having a family, they have to search for who they are and how they connect with the world. And they have no family to calibrate that. And therefore, they fully realize their potential. And that makes them incredibly challenging. In the film, where Oliver Twist, a foster child, an orphan child, an adopted child, says, in the film, not the book, he says, please, sir, can I have some more? He doesn't know why he shouldn't have more, because he's hungry. This, this, this challenge to society from the child who has no family shows how society is inhibited in caring for its most vulnerable for all kinds of reasons which were established, many of them, in the Victorian era. It's spectacularly screwed up, isn't it? That we should, we yeah. should make our heroes people we treat terribly. So isn't that incredible, though? Isn't it incredible? There you are. They are there in, in popular culture. They are there in real life. And ask yourself, why do we treat, think of them as a problem waiting to happen rather than as a, as a solution to our greatest uh, ills, which is... If the government is a parent, uh, then how it treats its child should be how we judge it above all things. Lem Cissé, thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, utterly joyous, thank you.